Welcome back to Engineering Acoustics. Hi, this is Professor Ryan Harn. When acoustic waves travel long distances, unique phenomena occur compared to when sounds are contained indoors. In this video, we'll learn about outdoor sound propagation. So let's get started. Many of our experiences with sound day to day or out of doors or involve some of the important wave propagation phenomena that are distinct to long distance propagation. Sound travels relatively slowly with compared to light. It travels only 343 meters per second on Earth, and it's traveling through a relatively low density fluid, which is air. This leads to multiple distinct phenomena in acoustics that are not as readily found in optics. These phenomena are delay, attenuation, and diffraction. Let's look at them one by one. The delay of sound propagating over long distances outside is one of the most common wave propagation phenomena out, out of doors that we experience. Let's use an example to learn about these quantities. Consider a plane is flying overhead at around 500 miles per hour or 223 meters per second. It's flying at cruising altitude around 39,000 feet, which is around 11,887 meters. The question could be, how far are we, are we going to tilt our head up from ground? Theta when we see the plane. So we hear the plane and look up, but we're not looking up 90 degrees as we might, uh, might already recognize. We're looking up a, sh a more shallow angle. So we need to run the numbers. The first number to evaluate is the time for sound to travel 39,000 feet. Let's use the SI units here. So we have 11,887 meters divided by 343 meters per second, neglecting the sound speed variation associated with the elevation. This is around 34.6 seconds. So how far will the plane travel in 34.6 seconds? Well, it's going to travel 223.5 meters per second multiplied by 34.6 six seconds. And this is around 7,733 meters, or in other words, 25,400 feet. So let's do the geometry. We've got a vertical of 39,000 feet. We've got a horizontal of 25,400 feet. By looking at this interior angle, phi, we find that phi is approximately equal to 33 degrees. So that means that we look up by an angle of theta is 57 degrees. So this is much less than 90 degrees. And it's clear, and it's clear evidence that there is significant sound delay in the atmosphere over long distances. But does sound attenuate when it's traveling over that same distance? There are many models for sound attenuation in the environment, and we often don't use them, and there's good reason why. ISO 9613-1 tabulates environmental absorption numbers for sound attenuation in the atmosphere. It's quantified in terms of decibels per kilometer. So let's take an example. 25% humidity leads to, on the mean, around 50 dB per km. So that sounds like a lot, but let's take one number into account, and that's 66. 66 dB. When sound traveling, for sound that travels one kilometer, there's 66 dB reduction due to the pressure amplitude that is proportional to 1 on R. So in other words, the spherical spreading alone results in 66 decibels attenuation, which is substantially more than 50, although 16 decibels doesn't sound much in a relative sense. Remember that it's a logarithmic scale. 
So a 16 decibel change is nearly an order of magnitude reduction. So in general, we neglect atmospheric sound absorption in our models unless we're dealing with very high frequencies, such as the upper limits of human hearing and ultrasonic frequencies. Diffraction is the third and final outdoor wave propagation phenomena that we'll focus on in this, in this video. Sound barriers are regularly used outdoors. They're often seen as highway barriers between uh, high traffic highways and residential areas. They also result from the use of large signage and walls. It's important then to quantify how much attenuation is achieved by the diffraction phenomena around this barrier. We recall earlier in one of the introductory videos that long wavelength sound can effectively propagate right past the barriers, whereas short wavelength sound is much more highly attenuated, creating these new edge sources that lead to this diffracted and bent wavelength. We ca characterize sound attenuation using theory that was originally derived in optics. Let's consider this example. There's a source of sound, a barrier, and a receiver. The source might be the highway, and especially tire noise, and the receiver some residence. We can identify two variables in here. The first is R. It's the distance over the barrier to the receiver for sound to travel. And D is the shortest distance between the source and receiver that passes through the barrier. The theory that we use to determine the sound attenuation by the barrier derives from the Fresnel number. It's a relationship between these distances and specifically the difference between R and D and the wavelength. R is the shortest possible path for the wave to propagate, whereas D is the shortest possible path that it propagates through the barrier. And it's important to understand how R and D change with respect to source and receiver location. Take this for instance. Now the receiver is on a hill, and the shortest possible path for the wave R is less than D. But according to this theory, there will still be attenuation. The barrier attenuation in SPL is then attenuation barrier is approximately equal to 10 log base 10 of 20 times the Fresnel number, and this is in dB. We note that this equation only holds when R is greater than D. Let's consider an example to wrap our head around these design characteristics of barriers. So here we have a noise source. It's a highway. It's 30 meters from a barrier that we will design. There are residences from the barrier gapped off by about 100 meters. How high does this barrier need to be, parameter h, in order to attenuate 250 hertz noise by 25 decibels? So let's work backwards. The absorption we desire from the barrier needs to be 25 decibels. We know our equation a abs is equal to 10 log 10 of 20 times n. So when a is 25, n needs to be 5, our Fresnel number. d, the distance between the source and receiver in this case, is just the sum of c and b. It's 130 meters. Our wavelength is 2 pi on k. And if we substitute in the equation for omega, we find that this equation is the same thing as c on f. Running the numbers, we find that the wavelength is 1.37 meters. Now, our Fresnel number is equal to 2 on lambda multiplied by r minus d, so that we can solve for r, and it's around 133 meters. R is able to be determined through another way. Through trig trigonometric identities, R is C squared plus H squared square root plus B squared plus H squared square root. So we know R, C, and B 
how can we then solve for h, the height of the barrier? Well, we can't solve directly using this equation, but we can solve by guess and check or numerically using computers or MATLAB, whatever you would prefer. And if we do this, we find that h is around 12 meters, or in other words, 39 feet. So this tells us in order to attenuate by 25 decibels, low frequency noise, 250 hertz, which is very common for tire noise, we need a 40 foot barrier. This demonstrates how difficult it is as well to attenuate low frequency noise. So let's summarize what we've learned. We've learned that sound delay can be significant outdoors, creating challenges to locate the sound source before it locates you. The absorption of sound by the atmosphere is negligible for most sonic waves, and it's much less than the reduced sound levels associated with spherical spreading. Finally, barriers are designed according to optics principles, where the relative size of the acoustic wavelength and barrier dimension influence significantly how much attenuation is achieved. That's it for this video. In the next video, we'll learn about microphones, the primary tools to measure sound.